I can't see that for some reason. Okay. Great, wonderful. So we'll give it a couple more minutes. It looks like there's people are joining and signing in. So welcome. We'll just wait a couple more minutes. Maybe not. So we don't want to take away from anyone's time speaking. So I think we should go ahead on and get started. But as always, Dr. Freeman, do you have any you know words that you want to say to me before we get started? I think you're doing a great job. So, yeah, you have a very good agenda, and we're ready to roll. All right. So we're going to get started then. I think, Colin, you have started the recording. So we just want to let everyone know that this session is being recorded. And soon as and we have some wonderful pictures to look at. Hopefully, you've enjoyed the slideshow. We're very Grateful that we had that opportunity to get those pictures, thanks to the communications department and to Christopher and her team. So we really appreciate that. All right, everyone, welcome to College Service Day to this virtual convening. This is fall session 2020, the start of a brand new academic year, and we are so excited. This is not the way we have planned to start off the academic year totally virtually, but it is working for us. So before we get started, we know that throughout the country, there have been some recent uh, tragedies with the loss of some lives. So we just want to you know, just kind of follow suit with what our president has started and others have continued with, is just to offer a moment of silence. So if you would please join me in a moment of silence to give reference and honor to those individuals that have been murdered. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, everyone. And again, welcome to Fall 2020 College Service Day kickoff. And we are going to get started with a welcome from our faculty member. I just wanted to say a few words about this faculty member. I got a chance to work with him on a few projects and work with him in PAC Day. Just a person that's full of energy, full of creativity, someone who cares a lot about our college, has been with Hudson County Community College for several years, and I'm sure he can tell you more about that as we listen to and I present to you our faculty welcome speaker, Eric Adamson. Eric, are you with us? Yes, thank you. Take it away. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to HCCC's 2020 fall semester. When Dr. Jones first asked if I would be willing to give the faculty welcome, I met with Lalisa. We had a wonderful conversation, and she said this part of the uh, uh, college service day is important because I would practically be the first person to address the entire faculty and staff since we left campus due to COVID-19. So she told me the speech just needs to be engaging, welcoming, encouraging, inspiring, powerful, meaningful, and funny, but no pressure. So I'm just uh, looking at some of the videos here to see if anyone's laughing. Okay, I see a few faces. Fantastic. Uh, I've checked funny off the list. I will not be telling any more jokes. Okay. As we start back into an exceptionally unusual semester, following a difficult spring semester and a challenging summer with not only a pandemic, but nationwide protests regarding the victims of police brutality, an important and stressful election year, and the complications that come with an economic downturn, it's important for us to focus on what we are capable of doing to make things better during a semester of almost complete remote learning. When I was a teenager, the concept of having a social life on the internet was just starting to become a thing. There was instant messengers, the first branches of social media like MySpace and Facebook, 
and shortly after that, online gaming. I spent a lot of my teen years doing the latter, filling my time with things like World of Warcraft. I still love to game today, and in fact, last semester, one of my students recognized my gaming laptop, and I said, yeah, I love to play video games, and I was met with jeers of, ooh, professor's a nerd, which is a badge I wear proudly. But during my time playing those games, I made numerous friends from all around the world who I never met in person. Many people, when referring to these friends, would call them my internet friends. But the truth is, I never saw them that way. I spent four to five hours a day with these people, sometimes even more. To me, those friendships were as real and meaningful as the friendships that I made in person. And I still have many of those friendships to this day, even though we almost never game together anymore. They weren't internet friendships, they were friendships. I think it's important to use this perspective in our understanding of remote learning. When we look at our classes this semester, we shouldn't try to see them as temporary classes, weird side classes, even distant learning classes, but simply classes. They are as real and important as the classes we teach every semester, and approaching them as such is our first step in succeeding over the course of this semester. And this perspective will also help us understand that the world of the internet is one that many of our students already live in for a large portion of their time outside of school. And that world looks surprisingly close to what our remote classrooms look like, especially in relation to video games. A study by Superdata found in 2017 that video game streams and online videos had more viewers than Netflix, Hulu, HBO, and ESPN combined. A follow-up study in 2020 showed that since the pandemic started, the number of people who watch streamers is up more than 50% since the initial 2017 study. Their flat numbers for streaming viewers was 660 million unique viewers. By contrast, the same metric used against Netflix shows 100 million viewers. But why does this matter to us? If you haven't ever watched a video game streamer, you should probably take the time to watch maybe one or two popular streamers before you begin teaching in a few days. They are eerily close to a classroom. There's the streamer who's the primary focus of attention. There are people chatting and asking questions. And the streamer is trying to manage both showing the viewers what they're playing while also taking the time to converse with viewers and answer questions, almost exactly like our class. So how do we transfer this into something useful? And why are so many people watching streamers? I'm not an expert on video game streaming or on remote learning, but I do have a few instincts based on my own experiences and what I've seen in the last six, six months. I've tried to whittle them down to three points to talk about today. The first is vulnerability. When you watch a streamer or teach or attend a remote class, there's an inherent vulnerability that comes with people literally seeing directly into your home. There's been a plethora of writing since the pandemic started about the anxiety of letting not only your teacher, but your classmates into your home life, which may be something that not every student is proud of or comfortable with. But if we can let ourselves be vulnerable in front of our students, we will inevitably build a better connection with them and one that will likely last even when we go back to in-person classes. We can help our students understand that who they are, where they come from, and what goes on in their home life does not invalidate their place in the academic world, but is actually welcome in that world. They belong, and we know that simply because they've shown up. Show your students your pet, your artwork, what you cooked for dinner last night. Talk about what you've been doing to get through working from home. Break down some of those barriers that have made quarantine feel so alone. The second thing is community. When you're watching a streamer, you're not only watching them play your favorite video game, but it's exciting to get to talk to people in real time about your thoughts regarding that game. As a community college, this aspect is something we're already good at. Our goal as an institution is not only to be a school, but to participate in the community, and remote learning gives us a perfect platform to encourage those discussions. Consider having discussions with your students before you lecture or begin an activity about using the chat function while the lecture is going on. Students may not only be willing to share more thoughts, but they can share their thoughts immediately before they forget or the thought becomes less interesting or anxiety takes over. Technology is providing us with the ability to let everyone share at the same time, and they can do it without interrupting the class. 
it's worth exploring and using these features to create a larger sense of community. And the final reason is to educate themselves. People watch streamers to learn. They watch people play video games so they can understand how to beat a difficult level or get advice how to play the game more efficiently or simply to watch someone who's really good at the game actually do it. People watch YouTube tutorials and cooking videos and streamers who are doing their makeup and creating art and sometimes even doing academic work. And this is exactly what they've come to us for as well, to learn, to watch the experts do it and then do it themselves. And even though the physical classroom is wonderful, it's important for us to realize that we've won a large part of the battle of education simply by gathering our student in an environment that 660 million people are already using and learning from. And this means that this isn't just a semester we have to get through until we can return to normal, but it's a semester that provides us with opportunities to better ourselves and tap into something for ourselves and for our students that we haven't fully explored yet. Even though it feels like we were thrust into the 22nd century overnight, I feel a great sense of confidence by acknowledging that it isn't necessarily unfamiliar territory for us or our students. I know that HCCC will come out of this semester better and with so many new tools at our disposal to complete our mission. With that, I wanna wish everyone good luck with the upcoming semester and I can't wait to see what we accomplish this fall. We're gonna do really great things. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Eric Adamson. Thank you for those words. They were definitely uh, energizing and insightful, so we really appreciate it. Now we're going to move on. Next up, uh, we're going to hear from our Executive Vice President and Provost, Dr. Eric Friedman. Thank you so much, Lalisa. You're welcome. I'm just uh, sharing, uh, splitting my screen here. So one second. Good morning, everyone. And thank you to all of you who have joined us on this WebEx. This WebEx, the Zooms you're on, they're all part of the new reality that provides us with an opportunity to see and to talk to all of our friends and colleagues. First, I'd like to thank the team members who contributed to the planning of today's virtual event. First, Lisa Williams, thank you so much. Eric Karakazian, Colin Moore, Courtney Payne, Cynthia Criolo, Dr. Daryl Jones, Desiree McFarland, Diana Galvez, Jaji Silla Samasa, Dominique Callens, Dorothea Graham King, Eduardo Calderon, Geraldine Kiefer Necklin, Jenny Poo, Jennifer Christopher, Ken Malewski, Linda Guastini, Mohammed Kassem, Omar Williams, Pam Bondiopadie, Priyanka Naik, Ruth Aman, Sharon Daughtry, Trisha Clay, Willie Shira, Zakia Hamamu. Wow, what a great team effort. How about a virtual applause? I am intrigued by what I'm calling the mirrored gaze. You, me, our students. We all watch ourselves as we interact on the virtual platform. Am I smiling? Am I looking at the camera? Do I have my, let's say, resting face on? Darn, I missed a spot shaving. After several months of intensive planning, engaged discussion, product sourcing, comparative research, a team of dedicated faculty, staff, and students created our return to campus plan during the most intensive period of challenge that the college has seen. All along, we focused on what a safe return would look like, and we received guidance and some direction from the governor's office, the office of the secretary of higher education, and other agencies. We were also guided by the wisdom of our task force members. We solicited feedback along the way. The health, safety, and well-being of everyone in our community has been the guiding principle. We have a plan. While we cannot prevent every what if, we will socially distance, wear face coverings, and keep our spaces cleaned and disinfected. We are confident that what we are doing will mitigate the spread of COVID. Wow, a year ago, I would not have thought that this would be the subject 
from the beginning of my service day remarks. Besides toiling to create our RTC plan, we remain fully committed in the midst of a pandemic to providing the very best educational experiences for our students. Thank you so much, Eric Adamson, for that inspiring opening talk. We changed modalities, pivoting mid-semester, demonstrated our flexibility, and didn't waver in our efforts to maintain quality. We reinvented practices and processes and adopted emergency measures to assist students. Our Center for Online Learning ran daily workshops and trainings as faculty members translated their expertise into remote experiences. We have great momentum in our online college. These efforts will not be wasted no matter what the eventual large-scale return looks like. IT services provided round-the-clock support and sourced Chromebooks for students who needed a workstation to continue their studies. Facilities team members surveyed every space on campus and started marking floors and moving furniture. They have been distributing PPE and sanitizer and working to make the environment fit to the new reality. Dr. Reber is going to acknowledge a large number of community members during his remarks, so I won't do so during my short time on screen. What I want to say is that people across the college, all across the college, have stepped up to make a tremendous difference for all of us. Each of us has a responsibility as well to commit to do what we can to follow the guidance of the health community we must follow protocols and look out for one another. We must make good decisions and take the whole community into account as we go about our work. COVID has changed the landscape, but it hasn't changed our culture of care. We care about our students and we care about one another. Gilbert Ryle, a philosopher, a specialist in philosophy of the mind, tells this story, and I've adapted it for HCCC. A prospective student shows up at the college and asks to be taken on a tour. So Dr. Friedman is available, and he agrees to take the student around. Let's call the student Abu. First to culinary arts, where he is introduced to Chef Bensky, who is busy in production kitchen one making chicken stock. Then they walk through the park, and over to building F, the nursing school. Abu gets to see the sim lab in action and gets excited. Then over to STEM where Dean Yearwood and Pfizer show off the Petri dish machine. And of course, a tour of the library, the wonderful art collection, a trip up to North Hudson where Amala, Natalia, Jason, and Yuris take Abu through the building. During the drive back to Journal Square, Abu turns to Dr. Friedman and asks, but where's the college? Gilbert Ryle would say that the student has made a mistake, what he calls a category mistake. Abu has mistakenly allocated the college to the same category as the Gabert Library and the other facilities. What I'd like to say is that the college is right here, you. You are responsible for the greatest demonstration of grit and caring and creativity that HCCC has ever seen. You have come together as a community to make a statement about what this college is all about. We have also watched in recent months together, encounter with police led to brutality and death for George Floyd. We have seen confirmation of a growing pattern of violence, racist violence, anti-Semitic violence, violence in too many forms, and the list of names of those directly affected is too long and has been added to in recent days. Our president has messaged out clearly where we stand and our members of the President's Advisory Council on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion have bonded together to create meaningful events and experiences that have brought our community together. This is a good place to work, a healing place, a community college 
at the heart of a city that sits at the heart of a county, then we are proud of our diversity and we celebrate that diversity. These are not easy times, but they are exciting times. We have completed our academic master plan, one of the cornerstones of our next strategic plan. Dr. Jones will have more to say about the AMP in a few minutes. We are ready to launch our next college-wide mission review later in September. We have completed our Achieving the Dream Action Plan by bringing together a dream team of devoted volunteers who believe we can move the needles in the key areas of student success. We have finalized our areas of focus for PAC Day. These are community efforts, and we are strong, stronger than we thought we were before all of this started. I see it, I feel it, I experience it every day, seven days a week. So we're together here virtually, but we're together. And we're making a difference in our students' lives each and every day. Keep calm and carry on. Thank you and have a great semester. Wow, that's a, so we thank you so much, Dr. Eric Freeman. And we're going to, uh, we would, I wish we had more time where we could, you know, kind of delve into some of those points you were making. I just want to let everyone know, thank you so much for chatting in the chat room. You're certainly welcome uh, to make different comments in there, and we really appreciate it. So now we're going to move on. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Friedman, for that inspiring message. I, I really, coming together, sticking together, standing up together. Uh, this is amazing. It's a great college. You're right. It's a great place to work. Now we're going to hear from our president, Dr. Christopher Reber. Dr. Christopher Reber is now going to come and inspire us with many points. And I'm sure you will be listening very intently. You can, again, you can make comments in the chat room. You can also make comments directly to any of the panelists, and they can re always respond at their leisure. So thank you, Christopher Reber. Thank you. Take it away. Thank you so much, Lalisa. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Thank you. I'm not sure I'm going to inspire you. I can tell you all, you inspire me. I want to thank both Eric's. We're off to a great beginning. It's wonderful to see all of you. It's a great pleasure and honor to join you this morning to take stock of the tremendous challenges we've faced and navigated together, and also to look forward to the coming year. Today, we begin a new academic year, and we contemplate how we might anticipate and navigate a new normal. We've been through a lot together, and I've been inspired every day by the caring and selfless acts of kindness by so many students, faculty, and staff coming together to support one another through adversity. We have never lost sight of our overarching goals and our guiding principles of safety and student success. Working as one community in more ways than ever, we've stayed on top of rapidly changing and concerning dynamics, and, and as a result, we're ready to begin our new year in the best possible way. Together, we've achieved a host of notable outcomes. We planned a mix of fall courses and services, offering a balanced approach students need, including the opportunity for all students to maintain academic progress and stay on course to achieve their academic goals. 85% of fall courses will be offered online or remotely, and select courses will be offered on ground in areas of greatest student need for face-to-face -face instruction. All student support services will continue to be offered remotely with priority services also offered on ground. Thanks to the leadership and the approval of our Board of Trustees, we've supported our students financially, keeping tuition level with no tuition and fee increases through all of next year. And we've allocated millions of dollars in federal stimulus funds and money raised by our HCCC Foundation through Hudson Helps to support our students' severe financial challenges to the fullest extent possible. We've kept our food pantries open throughout the pandemic, and we've begun adding meals prepared by our chefs to the distribution of food and supplies for our community members. 
we've purchased and delivered 650 Chromebooks to all students who have needed them in order to continue their studies online and remotely. We've significantly exceeded recommendations of the Centers for Disease Control and other health agencies in our safety precautions, and we've spent over $3 million for equipment and supplies to ensure that our campus is the safest possible environment for continued teaching, learning, and service. Together, we've also achieved what is likely the most flexible range of supports, accommodations, and outcomes for our employees. With the strong support of the County of Hudson, which increased our annual allocation of county appropriation funding by over 11%, over $1.9 million at this time of severe financial challenge. As a result of uh, that support, we have been able to hold all employees harmless. We have kept all full-time and part-time employees, including student employees, on the payroll throughout the pandemic. To date, we've avoided any employee layoffs, and we've honored significant increases in salaries and benefits negotiated last year with all four of our collective bargaining units, in spite of very significant financial challenges that we couldn't have expected that have been caused by the pandemic. We've offered all employees the option to continue working remotely throughout the fall, if necessary, for health, family care, or other reasons, and we haven't asked for documentation of that. Since March and continuing through the fall semester, we have offered employees the opportunity to care for family members and children without using accumulated sick or vacation time. We take pride in our leadership within the community college sector and all of higher education for modeling high standards in all areas, safety protocols, support for students and their ability to maintain academic progress, advanced training for those teaching and learning online, and safety support and flexibility for our employees. Collectively, these outcomes are truly extraordinary in what is truly an extraordinary time. We came together as one community, as a family, to achieve these outcomes and support one another. It's impossible for me to thank all of the thousands of faculty, staff, and students who truly deserve recognition for their dedicated and tireless efforts to support one another. They include the many faculty, staff, and students who've been working on ground throughout the pandemic and who will continue or begin working on ground to support our students in the fall. In addition, they include many more HCCC community members who continue to work remotely to support our students and our college's mission. They include the many faculty, staff, and students who worked long hours on our initial COVID-19 task force and later on our return to campus task force. They include colleagues on our all college council and our professional associations, our president's executive council, cabinet, our student government association, Phi Theta Kappa, and many other student organizations, our peer leaders, and so many others who came together to work outside of our comfort zones to rise to the challenges. They include our trustees and foundation directors who have provided steadfast leadership, advocacy, and support in so many forms every step of the way. Together, we agreed upon needed interim changes and solutions in how we test and place students into courses, how we stay up online and remote courses, and so many other supports for members of our college community. Together, we developed a pass-fail grading option for students who needed that reassurance due to their concerns about remote instruction, anxiety, life circumstances, and other factors. Together, we considered all options for maintaining the highest level of safety for our college community. We found ways to purchase and obtain needed technology, equipment, and supplies, and we developed procedures for managing safety and compliance with safety protocols under all possible scenarios. There are several individuals and groups I would like to specifically thank for their truly extraordinary leadership and support. And again, please forgive me as there are just so many whom time will not allow me to acknowledge, but who are also so deserving of our deep and sincere thanks and gratitude. I want to thank Dr. Daryl Jones and Kathleen smith Wenning who co-chaired our COVID-19 task force in the early days of the pandemic 
and establish the foundation for our approach, our planning and deliverables throughout the pandemic. I thank Sylvia Mendoza and her extraordinary team who developed complex procedures for distributing CARES Act, Hudson Helps, and other funding to students in need early, quickly throughout the pandemic and continuing through the coming year. I thank, from the bottom of my heart, David Clark, June Barrier, Larry Anderson, Bernadette Barnes, and the IT team who have worked at the food pantries and managed laptop deployments throughout the pandemic in spite of their own health concerns. I thank Vice President Veronica Zeitner and her accounting and finance team who implemented e-student refunds and direct deposits to provide faster student success to needed funding, maintaining seamless student account processes throughout the pandemic. I so thank Lisa Doherty and Heather DeVries, who co-chaired and continue to lead our Return to Campus Task Force with unwavering dedication, transparency, and integrity. And they've skillfully overseen the development and implementation of our HCCC Restart Plan. I thank Dr. Sheila Dynan and Heather DeVries, who have so capably chaired our ATD Dream Team, which has helped all of us keep a focus on student success throughout the pandemic and beyond. I thank the many members of our Dream Team who have worked tirelessly to develop our Student Success Action Plan that documents all we have learned and where we need to focus our energies going forward in order to achieve continuous improvement in student retention, completion, transfer, and gainful employment. This work is informed as never before by the analysis of data and the consideration of best practices nationwide. I thank Archana Bandari in our Center for Online Learning, Tricia Clay in Information Technology Services, and all of their team members for their unrelenting dedication to substantive and comprehensive support for thousands of our community members in the areas of remote teaching, learning, services, and new uses of technology. I thank Dean of Libraries, Jenny Poo, and her team for their phenomenal work to expand access to library resources, deliver training and special programs, and support students in all of their educational endeavors. I thank so sincerely Ilya Ashman, Julio Maldonado, Jack Quigley, and their team members for their expert and conscientious efforts to ensure that our facilities and services are safe, are prepared for social distancing, are tested, cleaned, and disinfected, all in an environment of constantly, daily changing needs and circumstances and concerns. I also thank members of our President's Advisory Council on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, led so capably by Uris Pujols and Lisa Williams for their inspirational leadership and daily efforts to support community members as we've encountered new acts of murder, racial injustice, and intolerance in our community and our nation that continue the long cadence of such violence and injustice. These horrific acts of violence have amplified our collective and individual distress and high levels of anxiety at this time of immense challenge for all of us. We can all be proud of how our HCCC community has come together to promote action, offer support, engage in dialogue and professional development, and expand upon our continuing focus and commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion in all of its forms. I want to acknowledge the leadership of Vice President Anna Kropitsky, coordinator of North Hudson Campus Amala Ogburn, and academic support services colleagues Natalia Vasquez-Botkin and Kyle Woolley, who have collaborated with many, many members of the college community to facilitate highly meaningful programs, conversations, and the sharing of life stories during this period of physical separation. They have helped all of us remain united and feeling togetherness and belongingness. These programs and conversations in no small measure have kept us strong together in times of despair and anxiety. Our employee spotlight has also been so wonderful and helping us thank and celebrate one another. I thank CARE team co-chairs, Dr. David Clark and Denise Rossilli, and team members Joseph Coniglia, 
Jennifer Christopher, Chris Conzen, Lisa Doherty, Veronica Gerasimo, Anna Kropitsky, Doreen Pontius, Uris Pujols, Jack Quigley, Jackie Safant, and Kathleen Smith Wenning. These caring colleagues have met weekly every Monday to support our students and other community members in myriad ways during this time of unprecedented challenge. And they're unsung heroes. Uh, these, they have been addressing complex, sometimes life-threatening situations affecting our community members. I thank Lisa Doherty, Matt Fessler, Sylvia Mendoza, David Clark, Veronica Gerasimo, Angela Tuzzo, Jose Lowe, and so many others in student affairs and enrollment services for their steadfast caring and enduring support of our students, including prospective students at all hours of every day. I also thank Victoria Orellana and Irma Williams for their conscientious behind the scenes work required to implement, implement the new pass-fail grading option, our new electronic faculty contracts, and all the challenges of the fall schedule. I thank Director of Communications Jennifer Christopher and her team for ensuring consistent messages to our college community and a positive presence in our social media outlets and other media throughout the pandemic. I'd also like to take this opportunity to recognize and thank the officers and leaders of our All College Council and our professional associations with whom my colleagues on the President's Executive Council and I work closely and collaboratively for the college community's welfare. We thank them for their leadership and support during the pandemic and their ongoing collaboration and contributions to our participatory governance processes. From the All College Council, we thank Chair Lauren Drew, Vice Chair Angela Tuzzo, and Secretary Kathleen smith Wenning. From the HCCC Professional Association, we thank President Michael Ferlis, Vice President Dorothy Anderson, Treasurer Claudia Delgado, Corresponding Secretary Tony Acevedo, and Recording Secretary Sirhan Abdullah. From the Academic Administrators, Administrators Association, we thank President Jose Lowe, Vice President Christine Peterson, and Secretary Angela Tuzzo. From the Support Staff Federation, we so thank President Dorothea Graham King, Vice President Patrick Del Piano, Treasurer Daisy Baeza, and Recording Secretary Hope Girontis. And from the HCCC Adjunct Faculty Federation, we thank President Nancy Lazik, Vice President Kamar Raza, and Secretary Rafi Manjikian. Valued colleagues, thank you for your collaborative and caring leadership. I also want to take this opportunity to recognize several of our student leaders, and I so regret that I don't have time to thank all of them. We thank our phenomenal peer leaders who also serve on our Achieving the Dream Dream Team, Coral Booth, will be the next student alumni representative on the Board of Trustees beginning in November, Patricia Colon, Suri Hidalgo, Hidalgo, Hilary Quavey, Crystal Newton, Brian Rebos, Tyler Sarmiento, and Abu Treor. We thank EOF scholar leaders and creators of the New Student Club, Latinx American Association, Kiri Hernandez, Rossi Castellanos, and Luis Flores. We thank all members of our Student Government Association, led so capably by outgoing SGA President Warren Rigby, who is a giant of a human being. Warren, thank you for your dedicated, consistent, and, consistent and unwavering leadership. You have been so helpful in so many ways and often behind the scenes. We thank and celebrate all members of Phi Theta Kappa, led by Darciani, Barbieri, Elts, and members of the Executive Board. Christopher Galarza, Courage Laban, Rocco Marsetla, Pedro Morinkel, Sofia Pasmino, Sherazad Souch, Abu Treor, and Isabel Vintamilla. We thank our student representatives on the President's Advisory Council for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Warren Rigby and Christine Torado. We further thank student representatives on the Return to Campus Task Force, Warren Rigby, Paola Leone and Sophia Pasmino. And we also thank all of our student tutors and student organization leaders in our STEM club and computer science club who met and worked continuously throughout the summer on campus frequently to support their peers and the college. In addition, we thank many student employees who worked over the summer to help and support other students 
and offices. And while I'm speaking about students and student life, I also want to thank Veronica Gerasimo, Angela Tuzzo, and all of their team members who support and mentor our students with superior dedication and excellence. They lead the finest student life and leadership programs I've observed in my 40-year higher education career. I also thank, from the bottom of my heart, members of the cabinet with whom I work so closely. To a person, these colleagues have offered unceasing and selfless leadership and support over the past six months. We've worked together nearly 24 seven to navigate challenges and leave no stones unturned in living, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and breathing our principles and serving our community. <clears throat> We felt and borne the weight of our leadership responsibly, together, and in unison. Right. It's an emotional time for all of us. All right. I thank Executive Vice President and Provost Dr. Eric Friedman, Vice President for Business and Finance, and CFO Veronica Zeitner, Vice President for Student Affairs and Enrollment, Lisa Doherty, Vice President for Human Resources, Anna Kropitsky, Vice President for External Affairs and Senior Counsel to the President, Dr. Nicholas Chevalotti, Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Daryl Jones, and Executive Administrative Assistant to the President, Jennifer Oakland. Now, I want to acknowledge I'm sometimes really hard on these folks, and I expect so much of them, and uh, <clears throat> they always come through and I thank them. <clears throat> In addition, I thank all members of the President's Executive Council and Marcella Williams and Alexa Riano in my office who lead and support our community conscientiously and with the greatest caring and skill. Thank you gifted colleagues and so many others unmentioned who make our mission of life-changing and transformational opportunity possible. As we've often repeated during this time of challenge, it truly takes a village, and our village remains united in its care, appreciation, and support for all community members. I look forward to working with all of you in the coming year to serve our students and our community and to realize our collective vision and aspirations for HCCC. As we begin a new year together, new in so many ways, we continue our mission central work as a community and family that focuses on student success, on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and other related priorities and values. Going forward, our work this year will include several interrelated priorities, considering lessons learned during the pandemic, including continued innovation in how we serve students and our college's mission. Continuous improvement in the opportunities for online and remote learning and the quality of the online experience, specifically informed by our collective experience since last March. Remaining laser focused in our efforts to promote student success, guided by our new Student Success Action Plan. This includes continuous improvement in how we address student needs, including holistic supports, how we remove barriers to student retention, degree completion, transfer, and gainful employment, and how we address equity and other student achievement gaps. Addressing our shared values and goals for reaching new levels of excellence in our support for diversity, equity, and inclusion in all of its forms, informed by the overarching goals developed by PAC Day following their first year of leadership and service in this area of institutional priority. Very importantly, integrating and acting upon vital planning over the past year, including the academic master plan, student success action plan, and the overarching priorities of the President's Advisory Council on diversity, equity, and inclusion. In review of our mission and the development of HCCC's next comprehensive strategic plan, which will be built upon all of these foundational efforts. As I begin my third year at HCCC, what continues to inspire me most is the commitment everyone here has to our students, 
we have the privilege of working in an institution that changes and transforms lives. And it's clear that our core common value, what everyone here champions, is our students and their welfare. In spite of the unprecedented challenges of the pandemic and the pervasive challenges of racism and intolerance that were manifest so brutally locally and across the nation over the past year, the 2019-20 academic year was a monumental one for HCCC, thanks to the efforts of everyone in our community. I'd like to um, ask you to allow me a few more minutes to review some major accomplishments over the past year beyond those I've already mentioned related to the pandemic that are re the result of the entire college community's dedicated commitment to supporting our students. Together, we've achieved significant growth, development, and outcomes in so many areas. Notable examples include, and these are in no specific order, our Educational Opportunity Fund program, which doubled the number of students served while maintaining high levels of student success, thanks to the passion and caring of EOF Director Jose Lowe and the entire inspirational EOF team. Our honors program, which also saw phenomenal increases in student participation and achievement under Jenny Bobea's expert leadership. Our institutional research program, which has been reorganized under John Scanlon's exceptional leadership to offer new levels of meaningful data to inform our college's continuous improvement goals. Our advising program and our academic tutoring and related student supports support services and programs, which have served more and more students and more comprehensively and efficiently while removing barriers to student success. We thank all of our dedicated advisors and counselors under Dr. Sheila Dinans and Dr. Pamela Bandiopadie's leadership. Our continuing education and workforce development programs led by Dean Lori Margolin, which have continued to grow and develop into a regional and national model for workforce development. Last year, HCCC was the only community college in the United States and Canada to host an Aspen Institute-sponsored Workforce Leadership Academy. And in addition, we soon expect to announce an $850,000 corporate gift to advance educational excellence at HCCC. This transformational gift is the result of the entrepreneurial leadership of Lori and her team, supported by Vice President Nicholas Chevrolati. Last year, we came together, and this is maybe one of the most meaningful things I've experienced and watched in my career. We came together as one community to develop the new Hudson Helps Resource Center that includes two HCCC food pantries, a career clothing closet, social work graduate interns, Department of Family Services representatives, emergency funding assistance for students, childcare assistance, for students, faculty, and staff, SNAP benefits assistance, and more. This is the work of students, faculty, and staff across the college and its campuses, as well as valued community partners. And I offer special and heartfelt thanks to Dr. David Clark for his extraordinary and inspirational leadership. We celebrate great significant work to improve our processes and services for supporting individuals in distress, informed by the consultancy of Dr. Brian Van Brunt, Executive Director of the National Behavioral Intervention Team Association. Similarly, we thank Vice President Lisa Doherty, Associate Vice President Daryl Jones, and their colleagues for leading a comprehensive review of the college's ADA 504 compliance activities in partnership with Salome Hayward and Associates, a nationally respected consultant in all areas of accessibility services and compliance. We established a new Office for Accessibility Services hired Jackie Safan as director, and have begun the development of new and enhanced accessibility services under Jackie's strong leadership. We further celebrate completion of the comprehensive renovation of 81 SIP Avenue to become HCCC's first and state-of-the-art student center. We thank executive director of the Secaucus Center and early college programs, Dr. Chris Conzen and his team for the highly successful startup last year of HCCC's new Sea Caucus Center at the Frank Gargiulo campus of Hudson County Schools of Technology. The center now serves more than 257 students in HCCC's early college and evening programs. The first cohort of 11 high school dual degree students completed their entire HCCC associate degree when they graduated high school last May. 
and I'm delighted to say that 48 students are participating in this dual degree completion program in the coming year. With leadership from Dr. Paula Roberson, Director of the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Innovation, we've collaborated with the American Council on Education and the Association of College and University Educators, or AQ, to provide full and part-time faculty with opportunities for high-level professional development. Currently, 20 faculty are participating in AQ's Certificate in Effective College Instruction Program, focusing on evidence-based teaching practices that improve student engagement persistence to graduation, and deeper levels of learning. We thank Dr. Roberson and our faculty participants for their involvement in this nationally recognized program that we hope to continue to offer interested faculty going forward. Over the past year, a team of faculty, staff, and students was fully engaged with our consulting partner, iFactory, in leading and supporting the complete and comprehensive redevelopment and redesign of the college's website. This exciting project will employ new uses of technology and new media to reach expanded markets and promote student and institutional achievement with a focus on the use of student testimonials. No one tells the story better than the students who, who are the story. Redesign of the website is in an advanced stage and we continue to launch the new site. We expect to launch the new site in early 2021. I thank Lisa Doherty, Jennifer Christopher, Omar Williams, and so many others for their diligent leadership and support of this truly monumental project. We also take great pride in our new comprehensive partnership with Europe, New York, New Jersey, through which students are provided internships, soft skills instruction, coaching, and mentoring while pursuing an associate degree that's fully funded through corporate sponsorships. Last year, our Board of Trustees adopted a new college policy on recruitment, screening, and hiring. And with the full input of our college community, we develop procedures to ensure best practices in developing a qualified, professional, talented, inclusive, and diverse workforce. We thank Vice President of Human Resources, Anna Kropitsky, and others for the leadership of this important work. And we thank Patricia Clay and all of our ITS colleagues for installation of new state-of-the-art virtual desktop infrastructure, or VDI stations, throughout our campuses, and new state-of-the-art ITV equipment that's, that will provide opportunities to offer courses for students at both the Journal Square and North Hudson campuses si simultaneously, allowing us to offer more programs uh, to serve the residents of Union City and beyond. Over the past year, we celebrated nationally distinctive student faculty, staff, and trustee accomplishments and recognitions, including, I'm going to name a few, our Abigail Douglas Johnson Center's receipt of the Frank L. Christ Award from the National College Learning Association in fall 2019. This award recognizes the single outstanding learning center among all two-year colleges nationwide. Kudos to Associate Dean Pam Bandiopadier, Head Tutors Kyle Woolley and Natalia Vasquez-Bodkin and their colleagues. Board of Trustees Chairman Bill Netchert's receipt of the 2019 ACCT M. Dale Ensign Outstanding Trustee Award for the entire Northeastern United States, and Professor of Humanities Laurie Riccadonna's receipt of the 2020 ACCT Outstanding Faculty, Faculty Member Award for all of the no Northeastern United States. Laurie will be honored at ACCT's National Convention, the ACCT Leadership Congress, in early October. These are very significant honors, which are exceptionally well deserved. To have two HCC community members honored back to back in this way is truly distinctive and a point of great pride for our college community. And similarly, we celebrate Professor of History Tony Acevedo's receipt of the American Association of Community Colleges Dale P. Parnell Faculty Distinction Award, a prestigious and well deserved national recognition of Tony's outstanding teaching. This also marks the second consecutive year that an HCCC faculty member has been recognized with this award. As Professor of English Katie Sweeting was a Parnell Scholar in 2019, and we also celebrate Katie's Fulbright Scholarship to teach in, e in India. I haven't caught up with her to see if and when that's going to happen. We celebrate HCCC graduate and Phi Theta Kappa member Abdella Armar, who was awarded a prestigious Jack Kent Cook Foundation Scholarship last spring. This is the second consecutive year 
in which an HCCC student has been named a Jack Kent Cooke Scholarship. This is a big deal. Abdullah is one of just 50 students nationwide to be named a 2020 Jack Kent Cooke Foundation Undergraduate Transfer Scholarship. This highly competitive national scholarship provides recipients up to $40,000 per year for up to three years to complete their bachelor's degrees and an opportunity for an additional $75,000 scholarship to pursue graduate studies. We celebrate alumni representative to the Board of Trustees of Darahim Sali's receipt of the nationally prestigious Goldwater Scholarship for Excellence in STEM Research. It's only the second time that a New Jersey Community College student has received this scholarship since it was established 35 years ago. It normally goes to high-achieving four-year students. We also congratulate Abderrahim for receiving the Phi Theta Kappa August Weight Scholarship, Brian Rebos for the Coca-Cola Leaders of Promise Scholarship, Irina Quino for the Hearst NCLEX Scholarship, Rama Gatto for the Walgreens Pharmacy Technician Certification Scholarship, and Kayleen Segovia Vasquez for the Coca-Cola Academic Team Ron Scholarship. We further celebrate Phi Theta Kappa students Brian Rebos and Abderrahim Sali for their invitation to participate in the highly coveted NASA Aerospace Scholar Internship Program last spring. In addition, we honor Rimsha Bazaid and Kayleen Segovia Vasquez for being named to the New Jersey All-State Academic Team. And moreover, we celebrate continued excellence of our Beta Alpha Phi Chapter of Phi Theta Kappa, mentored so caringly by Professor of Math Mathematics Ted Long Ted was so appropriately honored this year with the Phi Theta Kappa Continued Excellence Award for Advisors. And again this year, our chapter achieved five-star and REACH chapter status, recognizing the highest levels of performance for PTK chapters worldwide. The Middle States region of Phi Theta Kappa also honored our Beta Alpha Phi chapter as a gold chapter. Several of our students were also named superheroes by the Middle States Regional Phi Theta Kappa, including Rimsha Bazaid, Anas Anasarawi, Salisha Mohammed, Sophia Pazmino, Jamie Swanson, and Christine Torado. And in addition, Salisha was named a top superhero. But why stop there? Brian Espinoza was named Distinguished Chapter Member and Hall of Honor Chapter Member, and Anas Anasarawi and Christine Torado received the Hall of Honor Chapter Officer Award. Wow. The R5 Theta Kappa chapter is, I don't know the words, dynamic, inspirational, life-changing. We also celebrate our radiography program students' 100% pass rate last year on the American Registry of Radiologic Technologists, or ARRT, exam. This coupled with our students' 94% pass rate on the nursing NCLEX exam places our School of Nursing and Health Sciences in the top tier of like programs in New Jersey and nationwide. We congratulate all of the students, faculty, and staff in these exceptional HCCC programs for their excellence. And as first responders and frontline caregivers, these students, faculty, and staff are heroes. We celebrate HCCC faculty and staff who were selected as major collaborators for the National Association of Staff and Organizational Developments May 2020 International Conference on Teaching and Leadership Excellence. Five HCCC faculty and staff presented 13 workshops. I think it's a first in the history of the organization. Their nursing and health sciences instructor, Sirhan Abdullah, business lecturer, Sharon Daughtry, assistant dean of student life and leadership, Veronica Gerasimo, director of faculty and staff development, Louisa Williams, and associate professor of English, Joe Coniglia. And we also celebrate 11 HCCC faculty and staff who received 2020 Excellence Awards from the National Institute for Staff and Organizational Development, or NISOD. They are instructor of Academic Foundations Math, Bernard Adamaiti, Assistant Professor of ESL, Shanine Carawana, Assistant Professor of English, Monica Chekai Cheka Lincoln, Assistant Dean of Student Life and Leadership, Veronica Gerasimo. Executive Administrative Assistant to the Provost, Linda Guastini, Assistant Professor of English, Angela Haber, Assistant Professor of ESL, Eva Kozlenko, Instructor of Medical Assisting, Dr. Jihan Nakla, Assistant Professor of ESL, Maria Shurka, 
Associate Professor of ESL, Rick Skinner, and Assistant Professor of English, Susanna Wexler. Congratulations, valued colleagues. We celebrate six HCCC students who participated in last spring's annual Harvard University Model United Nations in Boston, and we thank Model UN Advisor Joe Coniglia for his mentorship of these students year in and year out, and they are Cynthia Criolo, Soka, Sokna Diara Fall, Hassan Farad, Tania Maradiaga, Raul Mendez, and Abu Treor. We celebrate the outstanding contributions of time and talents of our HCCC Foundation Board of Directors, led and supported so skillfully by Nicholas Chevrolet, Chevrolet and Murdo Sanchez. Last year's HCCC Foundation Holiday Gala, entitled Cultures and Diversity, raised over $211,000 for scholarships. This is a 17.5% increase over the previous year and a near record in the history of this spectacular fundraising event that showcases our faculty, staff, and students in HCCC's nationally recognized Culinary Arts Institute. And there are many more outcomes we realize together, which time will not allow me to mention. All of these accomplishments reflect the dedicated commitment of our entire community to excellence and student success, which are central to our mission. Very importantly, these accomplishments are focused on our HCCC values, beginning with my own presidential goals that flow from our board approved mission, vision, and value statements, and cascading throughout the college through initiatives and day-to-day -day contributions of every member of our HCCC community. Indeed, every person matters. We celebrate every community member's contributions that collectively lead to our mutual success as a community and family. As I've shared in many meetings and conversations on and off our campuses, I continue to believe that community colleges are uniquely positioned to address many of the nation's highest priorities, challenges, and aspirations, particularly at this time of national challenge. We're a gateway to the American dream for the millions of students who join our communities and traverse our pathways, as evidenced by just so many of the examples I just cited. The mission and principles of community colleges to meet students where they are, offer access, support, and inspiration that can change lives and focus on the specific workforce economic development and quality of life needs of the community make this the most exciting and fulfilling part of our nation's higher education system. And I think it's particularly inspiring and fitting that Hudson County Community College continues to thrive even in this time of unprecedented adversity in the shadow of the Statue of Liberty. May she and we continue to bring light, inspiration, and caring to all of our people. Henry Ford once said, Coming together is a beginning, staying together is progress, and working together is success. Colleagues and friends, I pledge to do everything I can as your president to support our collective efforts to continue to grow and excel as an institution that's committed to serving our students, our community, Hudson County, the surrounding region, and beyond. I am honored to have the opportunity to work side by side with all of you. As we evolve toward and increasingly understand our new normal, mm -hmm. I look forward to our continued close knit work together to support our students and our mission. And moreover, I look forward to continuing to celebrate our successes and work through our challenges as one extended and caring family. Happy New Year to all of you. Thank you. Wow, that was totally amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Reaver. Um, the part where, you know, you were getting like a little choked up. I was getting choked up. I thought, oh my goodness. So thank you so much just for your transparency and for your leadership as everyone. And now we are going to hear from our next set of presenters. So we're going to hear from Heather DeVries. She's our associate, uh, she's our associate dean of academic affairs. And we're going to hear from Sheila Diamond, she's our Associate Dean for the Center for Academic and Student Success. All right, take it away. Thank you, Louisa. Good morning. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to a brief presentation about our student success work and what we have learned throughout the past year. The meaning of the title 64 by 24 will be revealed later in the slideshow. 
and just a moment to recognize John Stanlin, Executive Director of Institutional Research, for his contributions to our student success work. Thank you also to all of the members of HCCC's Dream Team. Without you, developing such a robust action plan would not have been possible. Our student success work is better because of your dedication and expertise. As Dr. Reber noted, our first year with achieving the dream has truly taken a village. 2019-2020 marked a turning point in the life of the college. We launched an intensive partnership with Achieving the Dream and have put a laser focus across the college on student success. Achieving the Dream is a recognized national leader with a track record in improving equitable outcomes at many community colleges. Thank you to the Board of Trustees, Dr. Reber, and the Cabinet for their unwavering support of this partnership. This morning, we are going to show you just a couple of graphs on these next few slides, but we are not going to inundate you with data in the interest of time. So quickly, this is a big part of why we're doing this work. We're seeing the beginnings of an improvement curve from 13 to a projected graduation rate of 14%. Keep in mind that IPEDS tracks a three-year graduation rate for the quote-unquote first-time full-time cohort, which is a small subset of our overall student population. We know that a focus on improving retention leads to higher completion rates. Let's look at the next slide for the numbers of graduating students, and then we will look at retention. The proportion of students graduating is another way to look at the incremental but steady increases that we are starting to see in completion. As you can see on the right side of this table, as we move from 2017 to 2020, we see rising numbers of graduates, and we see incremental increases from 11 10 to 11 to 12 percent in the proportion of the total student body that is graduating. We have made a key decision to join the Voluntary Framework of Accountability, or VFA for short. VFA provides a different context than IPEDS, which focuses on first time, full time. VFA broadens the scope and timeline. VFA looks at all of our entering students full-time, part-time, first-time, or not. We, here we see that when we broaden the scope of the cohort under consideration and lengthen the time frame, we see that HCCC students succeed at rates closer to the national average. So if you look at the second and third rows, the numbers circled reflect, circled reflect that HCCC students, given a six-year time frame, succeed at almost the national average. Now let's look at retention on the next slide. This is our fall to fall retention rate for our first time full time student cohort. This is what we know and in three weeks at 10th day, we will be able to review the fall to fall retention rate for the fall 2019 cohort. The next slide displays our goal related to retention. Here's where the 64 by 24 makes sense. Our Achieving the Dream work led, led us to the identification of two overarching priorities. Our priority one includes a 10% improvement, which would move us to a 64% retention rate for the first time full-time subset of our students. This represents where the core work of the institution is. It takes a wide variety of different actions in different areas to get to that yellow star. This slide and the next slide are going to quickly give you two different dimensions of the same persistence challenge. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my co-chair, Dr. Sheila Dynan. Sheila? Thank you, Heather. This is our second priority. A guiding principle in our work is a focus on the culture of care that leads to the improvement for all students, not just the first time full-time cohort. Data shows us that student success inside of the classroom is linked to their success outside of the classroom. Students must be secure in their basic needs in order for them to perform at an optimal level academically. In order to achieve the 10% improvement in retention of the students, the data led us to focus on, and as you'll see, uh, our two theses are, addressing equity gaps in the completion rates of the ESL and developmental education students and connecting 
all students with services and supports by leveraging the roles of the student leaders, removing barriers that prevent students from persisting, expanding, the expanding services provided by Hudson Helps, and engaging students uh, with academic supports and providing them with academic supports. Uh, we provide a high level overview, and I truly mean a very high level overview today, but there is a wealth of data uh, regarding different demographic groups. For example, one would be how many um, students attained a certain number of credits in their first semester and in the first, first year, but we're not gonna drill down in that today. Um, this is really what we're giving you as a high level coverage, and we want to um, also make sure that you would have the opportunity to look more deeply into the data with John Scanlon's um, presentation this afternoon. Uh, let me go back a little bit. If any of you would like to be um, included in this and would like to volunteer for any of these strategies, we would be very happy to have you contact Heather or myself or any one of the co-leaders of the strategies that are posted above. And if you want to dive into uh, in-depth right now, um, Heather will post the next slide that will give you the website so that you can see the whole action plan that has been submitted. And I would like to uh, thank all of you on behalf of my uh, co-leader and our wonderful executive director of Inst institutional research. Uh, we couldn't do it without a team approach. Thank you all. So thank you, Heather and Sheila. That was very insightful, enlightening, and very um, inspirational. <clears throat> Achieving the Dream is doing great work, and we're so thankful to you all's leadership and all of those who are part of your committee. So we're going to just keep it moving. And now, next up, we will hear from uh, Dr. Daryl Jones, Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs. Good morning, Lalisa, and uh, hello to everyone that's on this College Service Day. How's my audio today? Good, wonderful. Um, I'd like to circle back one moment before I begin my formal remarks and just address something that Dr. Reber has mentioned. And I think it's worthy of saying that Dr. Reber, as our leader, you saw our current situation, a pandemic, as a disruption, as a disruption that really demanded not only innovative thinking, but action. It is because of your courage and your guidance that the college now sits not on castles of sand, but on solid ground, which we will usher us into a bright future. I've got to say from the bottom of my heart, and I think everyone on this particular um, WebEx will echo, you are valued and appreciated for what you do, and we would not be in the place that we are as we open our doors in, in a week or so to our incoming class. So again, you're valued and appreciated for all that you do. Thank you. So I am pleased to share our academic master plan 2020-2023. It is a blueprint that defines strategic direction for the academic branch. It builds on the momentum of the most recent self-study and peer review process and it provides key foundation stones for the college's forthcoming strategic plan. Launched in 2019, the academic master plan process was a growth opportunity for the college as we asked ourselves some difficult questions about who we are as an institution. This process was inclusive, collaborative, and comprehensive, and it reflects a number of developments at the college that you already heard more about and you will hear more this afternoon. Our academic master plan is aspirational. It is a living document that will be evaluated and assessed continuously over the next three years. So what does our academic master plan do? It describes our academic mission, which is to provide high quality educational opportunities that promote student success and are accessible, comprehensive, and learning centered. Our academic master plan delineates the strategies that the planning group participants agreed were needed to accomplish our academic mission. 
the academic master plan informs other college planning processes, achieving the, dream, achieving the dream, the President's Advisory Council for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusivity, and the strategic plan. And the academic master plan drives improvement processes for the college. In preparing the academic master plan, we engage a nationally recognized consultant, Dr. James Davey, who led a planning process last fall that was again inclusive and interactive. Planning team members engaged in a SOAR analysis as we looked internally at institutional strengths, opportunities, aspirations, and results that eventually generated areas of focus. At the January 2020 College Service Day, our community had an opportunity to review emerging strategic directions and define related initiatives. Through this process, we asked ourselves several important questions. Where are we now in terms of the academic mission and the current practices? What type of students and faculty are we currently attracting and will continue to attract in the future? What academic programs, services, support, and facilities are we using to attract students and faculty? What are we hoping our students know, value, and are able to do by the time that they graduate? We also ask ourselves, where do we want to be? What will make us distinctive and competitive into the future? And are we meeting students where they are? Are we focused on what our students need to be successful while they are with us and beyond? And finally, we asked ourselves as a planning team, what are the academic programs, services, support, and facilities we need to accomplish what we need to be in three years and beyond? So our planning process resulted in three overarching strategic directions that you have in front of you. Each, will clearly, each has clearly articulated vision statements, initiatives, implementation leaders and planners, and action steps. The academic master plan was forwarded to the college community earlier this week. It will be located on the academic affairs portal page. As we move forward into the next academic year, there will be many opportunities for all of us to engage with implementation leaders and planners as we fully actualize the plan. So at this time, I'd like to address a few of the key strategies in the time that is allotted. So strategic direction A, advancing a culture of care through focus, through a strong focus on equity. Our vision is that we commit to an academic culture of student success that promotes equity and embraces inclusion. This approach removes barriers in order to meet our students' diverse needs. The redesign of the ESL and developmental education program emerged as a central priority for the college throughout the planning process and was informed by a broad cross-section of faculty and staff. The purpose of this initiative is to accelerate students to college-level coursework, enhance early and sustain student engagement, and improve on key metrics such as student retention and completion. An overarching question is how do we better support our ESL students whether they be international students, recent immigrants, or Generation 1.5, by identifying and addressing barriers to success. Specific actions will include the following. Identifying best practices for acceleration and early student engagement, redesign of placement processes and practices, curriculum and assessment to maximize acceleration and early engagement. We will continue to hire qualified faculty and provide the necessary professional development to meet the needs of our students. We want to continue to engage in continuous process to not only assess, but track data to see how program and instruction is working. And we certainly want to leverage technology that gives students the tools and resources that they can meet their needs and make progress more quickly. English and ESL Associate Dean Jenny Bobea has already began to engage faculty to assist with gathering data on assessment practices in ESL, level test data, and graduation data from other institutions. John Scanlon is busy retrieving data on past fail rates, retention, and graduation rates. Early next month, Jenny and I will engage the ESL faculty in a focused dialogue about level zero and one and what our options are. We will discuss best practices for assessment and placement, 
faculty input in ESL final grading, development of an ESL certificate program, and again, how best can we leverage technology to enhance student success? In addition to our priority to redesign ESL and developmental education, we are laser focused on fostering the health and well being of students, especially those with disabilities, by helping them overcome obstacles that may otherwise prevent them from attaining academic, personal, and their professional goals. We are pleased that Jackie Stefan is in the role as Director of Accessibility Services. She has made an immediate impact in adopting a new delivery system model, and I hope that some of you are able to attend her presentation or workshop later today. Strategic Direction B, Advancing a Culture of Student Success and Completion Through Faculty Engagement. Our vision invests in innovative professional development aimed at facilitating faculty engagement in student success and completion. The college values recruiting and developing a diverse faculty, participating in high quality research based professional development and committing to equitable teaching and learning experiences for students. We will fully launch the Center for Teaching, Learning and Innovation under the leadership of Paula Roberson. The Center for Teaching, Learning and Innovation will provide a place where faculty can engage in dialogue, focus groups and learning experience that are focused on equity minded teaching and learning experience that again leads to student success. We're also very excited that the center will soon relocate to the first level of the L building, of course, with appropriate layout that's conducive to learning and also enhanced technological resources. Additionally, the academic master plan will guide us in ensuring transparency and allocating faculty positions based on strategic need promote diversity of faculty to reflect the student population, and also provide high quality faculty support to promote student success and excellence in pedagogy throughout the tenure process. Strategic Direction C, advance a culture of student success and completion through collaborative pathways and partnerships. Our vision is for Hudson County Community College to be a vibrant hub of educational industry and community partnerships. We all know that we serve as an engine for socioeconomic mobility, global engagement, and academic service learning that promotes social justice and empowers students to be agents of change. It is our priority to expand and enhance our transfer pathways in conjunction with local high schools and peer institutions and develop content and marketing plans reflective of the community's changing needs. We are excited about the work that Chris Conzen will accomplish with defining and enhancing new partnerships. Another important initiative is to elevate the accessibility or the availability of academic service learning, internships, apprenticeships, and partnerships. Ultimately, this will make experiential learning available to students, enabling them to develop the skills needed to secure employment and assist local businesses in meeting their employment needs with qualified, skilled workers. And finally, the academic master plan will ensure the creation of a comprehensive strategic plan for Hudson Online. The purpose of this initiative is to increase market penetration through further definition of a virtual college that serves a diverse community of online learners. Key is the development of additional online programs with each academic division and really capitalizing on the rich teaching talent that exists not only within our region, but across the country. This is a brief summary of the academic master plan. As we proceed over the next three years, there will certainly be many opportunities for all of us to share our expertise and engage in best practices that move the needle as we together identify new strategies to advance and influence student success for all of your students. Thank you for indulging me and I look forward to participating in the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones, for that update about the academic master plan and we look forward to hearing more about that. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take just a very short break, just in case someone has to get up and go do something, um, you know, really quick. So we're going to reconvene in about three minutes instead of five. So Go right ahead. We're just going to take a little break. You're certainly welcome to stay here. 
So for those of you who are here, but just realize that we are on a short break and we're going to start right back up at exactly 1035. It's 1032 now. So for those of you who are still listening and remaining during this short break, we just wanted to let you know that via the portal and or the program that was mailed out to you via communications, you did receive that uh, through email from Desiree McFarlane. So make sure you look at that program to find out about other workshops throughout the day, even going into the evening when we transition over to the ACFO. But we thank you for your participation. We thank you for your comments and questions in the chat room. We welcome uh, anyone that has any other comments or questions. You can reach us by email and or uh, text, or you can chat, or there is a Q&A feature. Just to let some of you know, because there have been a lot of questions about your cameras and your mics, uh, we are using WebEx Event. And WebEx Event, this is a feature that allows us to not have to try to mute you know, 30, 40, 50 people, should we have to do that. So we appreciate that. But all of the other sessions that you will attend today, you will be able to be on camera and you'll be able to you know, talk to the presenters and the persons in those webinars. Uh, every webinar for today will be via WebEx. There are a couple that may be via Zoom. But if you look at the program and if you follow the portal page, Go on the home page of the portal under academics. The first link we added a special link there, College Service Day. And it has not only the schedules for all day, but there's also a section there that just gives you a lot of various resources. So if you were with us in the past, you know we always had a resource table that had a lot of information from the various departments, things that you can share with your colleagues and share with your students. So we don't have a table in the e-building this time, but we do thanks to a team of people, uh, Linda, Dominique, and Priyanka. Just want to give a special a shout out to them and Omar Williams. So thank you, thank you so much. But they have made those materials available to you via the portal. And if there's anything that you need, please let us know. I think it's 1035, so we're going to move on. Welcome back, everyone. I'm going to turn it over. Back to you, Colin. Take it away. With the slides, that is. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so next, we're going to have we're going to hear from Archana Bandari. She is our executive director for the Center for Online Learning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to an unusual fall. Thank you for being here and giving me some time to talk to you. Next. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about this team that I have. It's been really wonderful how they've stepped up to the plate this summer, and I hope that you have each felt the support that we've tried to give you. Um, we've been working Monday through Saturday the entire summer. One of the things that I have been doing here, I've been here for one and a half years now. Um, I came from California is building the foundations, the structure of a virtual school. Um, we have reinstituted the online learning advisory committee, uh, built the team, clarified roles, and made a roadmap, set priorities and set goals. And there came COVID and everything went sideways. So we just adapted while maintaining our priorities. We have managed to support COVID related needs. Um, we still have increased our online programs from two to six. You can see on the slide the six fully online programs. Please encourage students to join the fully online programs as they can get an in-state in uh, they can get an institution even though they may be out of state. I think that's in county correction, sorry. So our focus this year has changed a little bit to navigating the pandemic and its related efforts. We've made some really new and met some really new and diverse needs. With the online and hybrid staying um, as they were, but then having remote and on ground as well. And we have been really, really working hard 
to give support to those who needed to get into Canvas beyond even just the credit bearing courses, um, bringing everybody on onto Canvas, giving training where needed, supporting the students when needed, um, creating the space, the trainings, the orientations, the workshops, doing a lot of that while we're trying to maintain our momentum moving forward in online learning. One of the other things that we have not, we have lost, uh, we have kept our focus on is diversity, equity, and inclusion. We didn't want to lose our momentum in that. We added Blackboard Ally, which is extremely good for giving access to students with diverse needs to different types of alternate file types. So if you put things on Canvas and you have students that have diverse needs, they can actually on their own request for, um, request for an alternate file type. This really helps students to feel more self-empowered and also to reach out for help without disturbing the teacher. We've been adding note takers. We've been adding resources in the faculty orientation that talk about accessibility. We have maintained our lead in innovation. We have made so many changes during the summer, maintaining the high, higher standards while introducing the change. We have introduced interactivity, multimedia, audiovisual lectures and content. We have uh, collaborated with STEM, Dr. Matari, and got virtual labs in for the science uh, sections who have labs. We have been responding to many needs in this emergency. We have been trying to add resources and licenses and agile, make agile changes, like our proctoring services, which we had already, but then we had to change the summer because students needed something that was friendly to Chromebooks. So this fall, we have changed our proctoring services. And if you come to our session later this day, morning, you will see a little bit more about it. We added new workshops for, uh, for our remote faculty and for our online faculty. We added a specific orientation for remote faculty and students. Um, we also support students with workshops and orientations, and we are supporting everybody through Monday to Saturday. One of the things that we did with collaborating with with the COVID committee and ITS was making the COVID plans and resources that address uh, online teaching and remote teaching available through the website. So if you go to the website to this online learning page, you can actually look at what our plans were, what the resources are. It's all kept up to date. It really explains quite well how we are trying to move forward with classes. The portal has been updated and the information is always updated throughout the summer and now as well for fall. So you can get access to all the resources that we are trying to offer you through the portal as well. We're trying to communicate regularly and through multiple channels, which is we, we are sending emails, we are, we are also joining Lelisa in her adjunct email and doing all kinds of communications within Canvas itself. We have collaborated deeply with ITS, you know, on computers for, for students, um, the technology that needed to be added. They've really been helpful in helping us in expanding our capacity and also working with the website. So balancing existing needs with evolving needs has been a really um, interesting time this summer. The faculty orientations, we had just, just started piloting the faculty orientation in fall last year. This year, we were supposed to bring the certification for online teaching, so we did that. We brought on the certification for online teaching a little early so that people could benefit using the summer for their certifications. The faculty online orientation for remote courses. Um, this is a course that teachers can choose to enroll in, and we actually have 181 teachers in it, which shows you how dedicated our teachers are and how they're trying to become really familiar with teaching remotely. We have two student orientations. The Hudson Online Student Orientation has been here since last fall, basically also 
is an automatic enrollment of students. Any student doing a hybrid or an online course gets enrolled in it straight away. We have our team members in these courses every single day, helping students make submissions, understand the tools, so that they can, when they come to class, they can actually really focus on the subject rather than the tool. So, as of um, last this summer, we have had 3,344 students in the online orientation for the online students, and the remote students have the classroom guide to Canvas, which they can again choose to enroll in. 515 students have chosen to go through this, the Canvas guide. It is really showing us how interested our students in, in being successful. We are really privileged to be able to help these students and, and faculty who are really keen on improving themselves and making sure that they can be successful in this new environment. The new workshops that we have created cover everything from transitioning to a canvas when, when the pandemic began to now we are doing copying and sharing resources, which a lot of teachers want to do for fall. We've had 371 faculty members go through our workshops and 350 students also take advantage of our workshops. Focusing on student success has been one of my team's main, main goals. We make decisions based on impact on students, and sometimes they may seem unreasonable at that moment, but we are really thinking long term for what impact it has on students. We're pr trying to promote quality in online and remote courses. We have sent out emails with attachments that tell students uh, how to get into courses, and we have sent it to faculty, setting some standards for online faculty and also giving remote faculty standards that they could adopt if they wish to. We have set some development, course development standards which talk about quality and we have about 100 check boxes there to be honest. It's, it's long, but it talks all about accessibility and so many other things that we really need to be looking into. The online advisory committee has formed a quality subcommittee which does um, the academic review when we are developing new courses. We have increased support. We have uh, pr free professional tutoring on demand in every course. So if a student goes into Canvas, gets into the site of the course, on the left side and even on the landing page, they will see tutoring that's offered on demand at any time. And they actually have subject specific tutoring as well. Canvas technical support is available 24 7, 365, both to faculty and to students. And our own team is covering support from Monday through Saturday, as mentioned before. We are going beyond the bounds of just the college. We are going further out and we are contributing and collaborating with the Distance Education Affinity Group and the New Jersey Council of County Colleges. We are sharing resources with each other. We're all focusing on students. They're wonderful groups, and they're really, really focused on student success. We don't hold back anything. We share everything with each other. During the summer, we have had professional development, and um, I've actually been a part of the core group in response to COVID, and presented personally on three workshops. But there are, there are a series of workshops, and we make sure that we keep advertising to faculty so that they can take any workshop that they feel is relevant to them. So at this point, I would like to say, have a wonderful, wonderful semester. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you so much. And next up, thank you so much for all of those updates. We so appreciate the Center for Online Learning all of your team, all of the other people that are connected and collaborate with what you all are doing. We wouldn't even, you know, we, you between your office and ITS, I mean, makes all of this possible. So we really get an opportunity to see how it all works in real time. And we're going to hear from you later in your workshop. So thank you and your team so much. Now, next up, we're going to hear from our vice president from human of human resources, Ms. Anna Kravinsky. Oh, no, is it a break? Oh, wait, no, we had the break, sorry. 
Yeah, so we're going to hear from Anna next. Thank you, Lisa. You're welcome. And thank you, Colin, for the presentation. So let me just make sure I can navigate it. Press the up and down arrow. If you look onto the left hand side of the actual, some little gadgets over there, do you see them? No, I don't see them. Not sure why. Okay. Um, we, can talk, we might have to pass you, or you have the presenter's ball. So when you move your mouse around on the screen over to the left on the actual screen itself, on the PowerPoint. No. Okay. Just you, Colin, you can pass it to me for a minute and I can advance her slide, please. Okay, there you go. So you can start there, Anna, and you can just tell me next when you're ready. So take it away. Thank you, Lalisha. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, and thank you all uh, to all the organizers of the Fall 2020 College Service Day. I don't know if you noticed, we have over 260 participants logging in. That's really wonderful. Um, I am honored to provide some updates and information on behalf of our human resources team. First, um, uh, I would like to echo the heartful message of coming together by Dr. Friedman and Dr. Weber's very long list of recognitions and his inspirational leadership. Our HCCC community has really pulled through an unprecedented time. Uh, Lisa, you can go to the next slide, thank you. So more recently, I am grateful for all of the individuals who have contributed to the major planning efforts on the Return to Campus Task Force and the leadership of all the working groups. It is a fantastic group of people who have very diligently, carefully, and compassionately allowed some of us to come back to campus with implementation of various health and safety measures and protocols. So I would like to briefly emphasize these planning efforts. Uh, in addition to the task force resources page, we put together a list of comprehensive frequently asked questions. Uh, for general safeguarding, I would like like to emphasize the additional resources the college has invested with regard to cleaning, air purification, masks, supplies, signage for social distancing, and training for all students, faculty, and staff. And so all of this information, including a copy of the reopening plan, can be accessed from the main HCCC website. I will leave the next slide, please. Thank you. Next, I would like to recognize again our unofficial planning committee that has facilitated and coordinated all, all the wonderful professional development programs throughout the spring and summer. Amala, Natalia, Kyle, I feel really lucky to have gotten to know these individuals as part of the planning efforts because they're really uh, truly incredible. And working with Ms. Lelisa Williams in our Office of Faculty and Staff Development, we will continue providing opportunities to show off our employees' talents, experiences, and expertise throughout the academic year as we continue the professional development series for employees by employees. Uh, we will also offer training opportunities in implicit bias, as well as sexual harassment in Title IX with our wonderful Title IX team. We want to ensure awareness of new regulations regarding Title IX, as well as other compliance trainings. Did I mention that we have some remarkable individuals and departments at HCCC? Um, so over the past few months, the silver lining of our remote learning and working environment has enabled us to more easily connect and engage with one another. This naturally allowed us to collaborate, to conceptualize and implement these wonderful programs. I'm noting here some of the upcoming highlights, all of them featuring our very own members of the HCCC family. Uh, this includes the upcoming Stories Untold, Candid Conversations with Men of Hudson, Ripple Effects and Colorism, and the Power of Habit book talk that we will begin next week. So these college-wide programs are possible because of the true collaboration of individuals 
representing the Presence Advisory Council on, on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, the Academic Support Centers, the College Libraries, we have a Rockstar Library, the North Hudson Campus, um, and the College Life Committee of the All College Council, among others. If you're interested in collaborating or hosting a program, please feel free to reach out to me. I would also like to recognize the contributions of our HR team, starting with Stephanie Sargent, who has graciously taken on the big ask of organizing so much of our recognition and appreciation programs. Also, for those of you who participated in the Steps for Wellness program we had over the summer, you may know Stephanie Pina, and I don't know how we ever survived without her. Um, I would like to highlight one of these programs, the commencement of the Hudson Employee Spotlight, which we began in April and have been receiving a steady flow of nominations by colleagues to enable us to feature someone every single day. So someone noted to me that the best attribute of this program is the ability to get to know members of our HSC community that you may have never seen before, even if you've been working at the college for many years. So we are most thankful for the continued submissions, keep them going, uh, to allow us to highlight individuals and teams who are admired for courage, outstanding achievements, or noble qualities as they promote HCCC's mission and values in their daily work. So fall is an important time for our benefits area. I would like to thank Carmen McGuire for coordinating all of our benefits-related questions and programming. We will have a very busy October with the annual benefits fair and open enrollment period. Uh, please stay tuned for communications regarding vendors in session, retirement and health benefits webinars, as well as other educational uh, um, workshops. This year, we're also looking to expand some of our benefits eligibility to our part-time employees. We have a very strong workforce of our part-timers, some who have come back to us for many, many years. Um, otherwise, I just wanted to remind everyone of our longstanding benefits information, as you can see from this slide, with the emphasis on the employee assistance program. No matter what you're feeling or experiencing during this unprecedented time, please feel free to reach out. Release the next slide, please. And finally, I would like to highlight the contributions of Antuma Jane and the college's efforts to streamline our processes, improve our data, and most importantly, the adjunct and overload faculty contract process. Uh, this includes the implementation of the semi-monthly payments for adjuncts and those faculty teaching overload. Uh, but I should note that we really could not have done this, all of this, without the team effort of our payroll and finance, our registrar and academic affairs colleagues, as well as um, the ITS and our illusion teams. And so HR will start the academic year by offering both the continuation of all employee services and processes remotely, as well as some in-person office hours. Uh, so thank you again to my HR team for their diligence, hard work ethic, and passion for helping and supporting our HCCC employees. And thank you to the CSD Planning Committee for the opportunity to provide these updates. Please feel free to reach out to me directly with any questions um, or, or follow up. Thank you all. Thank you, Anna Kuhinski. Thank you so much for that update on all those services and programs that are being offered uh, by Human Resources. And we also want to let those who have asked questions, um, either to the panelists and or to any of the attendees, we will be able to address those questions at a later time. We want to move right along. So again, thank you all for you know being patient and staying with us. Next up, we're going to hear from Dr. Paula Roberson, the Director of the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Innovation. Uh, Paula Roberson, take it away. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We ask that all of you continue to become involved in the center's activities. Our overarching goal is to, to support faculty in professional development opportunities in accordance with the academic master plan and the mission of the college. We aim to continue to advance the mission by ensuring cross membership of the center's advisory board, defining a physical space for the center, 
developing a five-year plan to advance best practices in faculty teaching, learning, and research collaboration. To begin with, our learning cohort with the Q is in progress, has 20 active members currently enrolled. The participation rate is currently at 80%. This cohort is set for completion in December of 2020, and our completers will be recognized on our next college service day in January. On that day as well, our next cohort will begin. What we will do differently this time is suggest that each enrollee take, time, take a time management workshop offered by our facilitator, Sharon Daughtry. Secondly, a few of our ACURE certificate holders or graduates are going to volunteer to support new participants in the next cohort. Volunteers from the first cohort will share their realities of participation in the AQ course overall. You may have noticed some of these course takers' reflections published in the Adjunct Weekly or in the Happening. Applications for the next cohort will begin at the informational session to be announced in November. Next, especially for our adjunct faculty, we are continuing the adjunct faculty professional development online in a synchronous platform through WebEx. Please pay attention to um, the online announcements and communications for registration, which is available right now. Also, if you are not familiar with WebEx, there's training offered today and online continuously as we speak to become familiar with this software. The exciting news about the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Innovation is that we have in-house grant money. That's right, in-house grant money. The CTL Advisory Board made up of faculty, staff, and students are currently developing criteria for awardees to receive a nice um, sum of funds to plan their action, plan and implement their action research. This is an exciting new initiative. We recognize and acknowledge that continued professional development enhances teaching effectiveness and student success. Therefore, in keeping in with the mission of the center and the college, we aim to keep track of professional development through awarding points, a point system. This is one of our current projects, which the advisory board is in the process of developing criteria for, for the amount of points offered. So if you facilitate professional development or attend professional development, or if you're taking a course for professional improvement, it counts. The goal is that each internal and external professional development opportunity is, is documented. So if you're taking, um, attending a college book club, an HR workshop, or facilitating a workshop here, you can earn HCC professional development credit. This initiative is good for personal and professional record keeping and is useful for tenure and promotion. This is in keeping with professional practices offered at other institutions of higher education around the country. Next, if you are taking graduate courses or have a best practice in the classroom and like to share with others that improves teaching and learning, please send that information to me and we will work out a presentation for you. Next, there's Toastmasters, another way to earn professional development credit. Toastmasters is right here at Hudson County Community College. Toastmasters Club members are offered leadership pathways that prepare each individual for speaking and leadership opportunities. There is a pre and post assessment for each leadership path. I have learned that it is not simply speaking, it is accurately listening, evaluating, being humorous, or offering a word of wisdom, practicing speech-making protocols and re requirements for
for a variety of speaking situations. Come join a group of your colleagues here for a journey of fun challenges and personal and professional improvement. And as a note here, this very presentation that I am making is being evaluated by, by our Toastmasters judges. You can also contact uh, Sharon Daughtry if you're interested in being a part of Hudson County Community College's Toastmasters. Finally, this summer, more than 10 of our faculty and staff members hosted a book talk on white fragility in response to the brutal murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery. There was a core group that wanted to continue the conversation and keeping up with what is going on. I would like to recognize the following people for facilitating and being part of the conversation. Ruth Amon, Jenny Bobea, Andrea Siegel, Jeff Roberson, Belino Duasil, Anna Kropinski, Melissa Williams, Lisa Bogart, Amala Osborne, Robin Singer, and Angela Peck. This conversation was personal and professional, compelling and cathartic, authentic and academic, but most of all revealing and healing. These conversations will continue at the request of a core group of people. Please join us and look for the advertisements um, through communication. This Friday, our first conversation will begin with code switching. So look, we will post articles, video clips, short articles and video clips that facilitate you to join the conversation. Come and join us and join the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Innovation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paula Roberson, for those updates on what's happening with AQ, what's happening with the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Innovation, and what's happening with Toastmasters. I thought that was an extra, a, a nice touch. And I hope your evaluation goes very, very well. So you're doing great. You're doing great. And we're doing great with Toastmasters. But we're going to keep moving right along. Now we have next up, we're going to hear from um, Tricia Clay, our, Ch our Chief Information Officer, and Yuris Pujols, Executive Director of the North Hudson Campus, otherwise known as my partner for Pat Day. All right. So <laughs> take it away, Tricia. Good morning, everyone. So this will be interesting in that Iris and I are presenting from not in the same room. <laughs> so passing the passing the ball back and forth is going to be more interesting. I just wanted to say good morning to everyone. Welcome back for fall 2020. And I'm joining you from one of our ITV rooms in A Building 418. So you may... I'm here by myself, so some of the features will not be as obvious, but you may, if you were watching closely, you may have noticed the camera focusing in and out. I'm not touching anything. It does that as I talk. So new this fall, we have ITV classrooms. There are some pictures there on our presentation. One is of a, a screenshot of what a recorded uh, session would look like with the transcription on the right hand side and then at the bottom is another uh, picture from the Gabert Library L418 I believe. I get confused these room numbers are all similar. Um, so what's the difference with ITV classrooms? It's the technology like this bird hanging out in air here we are uh, with a camera that focuses, and we don't have to do a whole lot to make it happen. Yuris, do you want to speak a little bit about the goals of the ITV project? Of course, Tricia. Thank you so much. And I think this slide might be going a little bit too fast. If we could go up to the previous one with, with the with the bird, I would uh, I would appreciate it. Um, first. So I want to thank everyone for uh, Lisa for organizing this event and everyone who spoke earlier and for the opportunity to be here to share this uh, very exciting uh, project. Um, 
uh, like many many of you, uh, like all of you, I am excited about the fall semester, and I'm also looking forward to the day when we can have this event in the same room as, as we used to. But uh, when it comes to technology, there's always a new piece of technology that comes along that changes everything, that revolutionizes the industry, and so on. And ITV provides a lot of incredible features that would certainly change or could change a lot of the, um, the way that we with our work and the way that we teach and the way that we meet, but this is not new technology. Our students, specifically the, the younger ones, the ones that come from the high school, they're used to you know living under a, a camera. They're used to the sound, to the connectivity, to the streaming. So um, I, I'm, I'm hoping that when we're able to deploy this, we're going to be stepping into the world and fulfilling a lot of their, their, uh, their expectations. So um, if we go to the next one. And, and this project was very, again, when we, this project came in, we, we were not thinking about um, COVID-19. We were thinking about how uh, we, do we look at our current operations and we make it more, more, more specific and more targeted. And the idea was to build, um, to, to build capacity, to be able to do more. And the project goals are listed here, uh, but, but the idea was to offer programs on our Hudson. If you're able to, uh, one class that you're offering at the main campus, you're able to to enhance uh, a room at North Hudson and do that, the students could provide the um, complete the program there. You could also, uh, if you have a class that doesn't do well uh, historically, like the class gets canceled because not a lot of people register for it. If you put it under this uh, format, you might be able to collect enrollment for both campuses, and that class could be a success. You could look at specific classes, uh, special programs, and uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, be able to, to offer more. So what is ITV, telepresence? We get asked that question a lot. What does this mean? Um, it's an in interconnected video that's over distance, right? So wherever you happen to be right now, you can still see me. Um, but telepresence is where, where you are able to feel as though you're in the room. So what I'm looking at right now is two big TVs where I can see the main presenter very large, and then our other participants. So I'm not looking at tiny squares. I'm able to really encompass um, all of the people and feel more like we're all present together at the same place and time. So what are the capabilities of this kind of system? You're a little bit familiar with using WebEx from home, so we're using that technology, but it also expands that technology. So we can have this connection between classrooms, conference rooms, and meeting spaces like the one I'm sitting in right now. Um, we can extend these classes and meetings between Journal Square and North Hudson. Students can join now remotely. We weren't thinking about that very much, but now in the world of COVID, this is very important. Um, content can be presented wirelessly. So you're not only limited to using a podium computer or knowing where the computer might be hidden inside of a, inside of a pod podium or a cabinet. And faculty can also record their lectures if they wish to or teach from these spaces. So the immersive technology is intrinsic to this system. There are not any special ways that you need someone to man cameras for you and zoom in and zoom out and know whether you're walking and uh, who's talking. It focuses and follows automatically, which is really important when you have a faculty member, say, in North Hudson and students on both campuses, as it can focus on the particular students speaking in the class. The system transcribes video automatically. It does a, actually a pretty good job, so if you're used to looking at YouTube's transcription and sometimes you wonder where it, how did it come up with that. I won't say it's as good as a human transcribing, but it's pretty good. Um, you can wirelessly screen and content share, and also there are audio receivers in these classrooms for the hearing impaired. So what kind of support? Uh, available. Yeah, one other thing I want to make sure is that whenever you talk about a new technology, a new feature, there's always, um, like I know I get very hesitant, like 
whenever there's anything new, like, okay, would I be able to do this? Would there be support? Would there be anyone to help me in case, you know, I turn on the button and it doesn't, it doesn't work? Uh, so so we, um, we had a collaborative uh, group effort. Uh, we pulled a uh, couple of members of the college community to, uh, to give us some recommendations. And one of the things that we're going to have, we're going to have a computer lab assistant staff helping. Like if you're teaching one of these classes, there will be a, uh, an academic lab assistant available at both locations. Make sure that they're able to provide support. Um, there was also this, um, this idea that we're also going to have um, an academic coach like in class, like if you're teaching one of these classes, right, you are basically, you could, I mean, unless we're able to uh, successfully uh, clone people, where you're only going to be able to be at one specific location at a time. So there will be one class that will be remote. So the idea is for us to have an academic coach at that other location to make sure that they could collaborate with our professor and, 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 and provide the support. And um, we're also working with uh, safety and security. Uh, we have ongoing conversations about providing some type of transportation support, uh, you know, to make sure that, that, that the project is seamless and, and helpful. Uh, courses to offer, that goes back to the original goals that, that we had. And again, this is pre-COVID, but the, the idea is that if there's a program in our thoughts and we identified a couple of them, that just by adding one class, two classes, three classes, you could fully offer the, the program in North Houghton, and that would certainly benefit people that live in Union City, West New York, North Bergen, and the, and the vicinity. Again, historically low enrollment, uh, enrolled courses, newly developed courses, honors, or any special cohort that, that might need like the enhanced uh, enrollment in order to be, uh, to be successful. And again, these are just uh, recommendations. If there's a program that you're thinking of, uh, a cohort of classes, that you say, hey, maybe this could benefit from this, please reach out and you know, we're happy to, to work with you and, 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 and collaborate. And again, when this program first came into being, the goals and the planning, no one was thinking that there was gonna be a pandemic to the life that like the one that, that we are we're living this has been unfortunate this has been incredibly taxing and challenging for for all of us for our communities our students and their families but one of the opportunities that this challenge brings forward is that as we go back to campus as we make sure that we keep social distancing these rooms these itb rooms provide an opportunity uh to um I mean, the one thing that we're going to do and give priority to, we're trying, uh, working, actively working to offering some, some of these uh, ITB courses during the, um, that quick term for fall 2020. But in addition to that, we also want to make the rooms available for individuals teaching the remote classes. Like as Dr. River mentioned, 80% of our classes are going to be remote. So if you feel as a professor that you want to come to campus and you want to use one of these rooms, so you could initiate and lead your classes from them and having all your students log in remotely, you know, they will be available to you as well. This would allow you the opportunity to, you know, take advantage of all this incredible technology and, you know, compared to maybe, I mean, some, some solar colleagues have uh, offices uh, at home, others do not. And if you feel that, okay, I might be teaching a class on a laptop, this would be an opportunity that we want to make sure that we make available to all of you. So again, a remote class, as a synchronous uh, class, you know, if you're teaching it just like a room today, that could provide a lot of um, a lot of benefit. I know we also want to put a call out there. If you want to, uh, again, this might be the new normal. If you want to record your lectures to have it there, that you could share it. These rooms will also be available there, and uh, you know, the support will be available to make sure that you get this as well. Yes, so the classrooms that you can find this technology uh, in are the rooms Right, these are the rooms that are outfitted, right? Um, L418 in the Gabriel Library, North Hudson 504, A418, as I said, this, this room right here, um, N703A in North Hudson, and then also the, colon the conference spaces, which this could be really exciting the next time we're all able to be together. Um, the Scott Ring Room and Culinary, North Hudson Multipurpose Room, the Banquet Space and Johnston Breakout Rooms on the second floor of the Culinary Building, 
and coming soon will be the STEM multipurpose room. So how can you learn more about this? We uh, in ITS have a WebEx resources page. You'll be able to find that in my Hudson from the ITS page. Um, there is coming a Canvas training module. There's a workshop plug this afternoon at 1230. Please join us. Join me, uh, Diana Perez, pa Paola Valcarol, and Kelly Garay from the Academic Computer Labs will be doing a uh, workshop and demonstration from the classrooms. And watch for future training announcements because there's more coming. Uh, Uris and I are working with Paula Roberson and Lilisa Williams, and I'm sure there'll be any number of opportunities coming your way. So here's more of that information. There, there are the links, so I'm not going to belabor. Email computerlabs at hccc.edu. And you can also email your SR or I. Any well, closing you. thoughts, Yuris? No, Fisher, just uh, happy to be here with everyone. I miss seeing everyone. I got a little bit nervous earlier when uh, Anna Kropitsky said that there were 600 uh, at 260 people on the call. I thought there were less, but uh, you know, I I'm glad we're done. And uh, looking forward to seeing all of you soon. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, everyone. Have a great semester. So thank you so much for that rich information. Thank you for updating on us on all that is happening with ITV, and we know there is more to come. So we're already seeing uh, comments in the chat area. So a thank you again. Feel free, those of you, whether you're panelists, attendees, presenters, feel free to visit the chat room uh, throughout, not just the morning session, but all of the sessions in the afternoon as well. Uh, feel free to uh, ask your questions. We have people on standby in those spaces in the chat area to just kind of help, you know, maybe answer some of the questions or direct you where you need to go. Want to remind everyone that all of the sessions, the, all of the links and all of the sign on information for all of the workshops starting at as soon as this is over, um, you will be able to, you can get that from the portal page. But I want to turn it over next again, thanking uh, Tricia and yours to our last presenter of the morning session. Uh, Dr. Christopher Kanzen. He is our director for the Sakaka Center and the Early College Program. And thank you so much for coming here today and delivering this important update. Take it away. All right. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, I am uh, Chris Kanzen. I am the executive director of the C Caucus Center and Early College Programs. I, I will get everyone at Hudson County Community College to say C caucus correctly. Uh, if I can do it and I'm from West Jersey, uh, everybody over here can do it as well. Uh, so I am excited to do uh, what I hope to be a five minute update so we can get uh, back on schedule. Uh, let me see, trying to advance my slide here. Um, doesn't seem to be working for me. So whoever's our slide advancer, could you, uh, could you do that for me please? We sure can. There, okay. thank you. Okay, so um, we're excited to celebrate, even if it was from afar, our first 11 dual enrollment graduates. They were 11 students from the Environmental Science Academy at High Tech High School who simultaneously earned their AS in Environmental Studies. We also inked new agreements with Hoboken High School for another dual enrollment program in Environmental Studies. We expanded the accounting program with North Bergen High School and also grew our partnership with Hoboken Charter School. And a piece of positive enrollment news, we saw our early college student population take 113% more credits in summer two this year than in 2019. <clears throat> Having some extra free time on their hands probably helped a tad. All right, next slide, thank you. So some of our challenges, thanks COVID. Um, of course, in our commitment to transparency, we have to discuss the challenges that we have and continue to face in early college. First, the uncertainty of how the high schools throughout the county would be opening and delivering their own schedules has made it difficult to plan our usual offerings for our partner schools. And I'm preaching to the choir for anyone who's a parent 
of any child in a local high school or local any school right now. Um, in fact, some districts are still tweaking their plans at this very moment. And some have said they'll go remote through September and some have said through October and some said we'll just, you know, put our finger up in the wind and decide when we will put the students back in classrooms and we have to roll with it. So uh, we remain adaptable and patient, but we know this will have a negative impact on our fall enrollment numbers. Um, our immediate focus, though, is to make sure those students on the degree pathways do not get delayed. So we will be working um, strenuously to make sure that those students get the classes that they need to take in order to stay on track. 2020 also brought the closure of two of our most active partners, Marist High School and Metz Charter School. While we're still attempting to work with former Marist students to continue the track they were on, these closures will impact the progress we had made. And of course, our families are facing greater financial difficulties. While in some of our partnerships, the school districts do cover the costs of participating students, the majority of our students are self-pay. Since high school students do not qualify for federal or state financial aid, even at the discounted tuition rate, it is a cost that some families cannot take on at this time. Add to that the additional cost, depending on the class of the textbooks or supplies that accompany some of our classes, and families have had to prioritize other expenses. Next slide, please. That was supposed to be an animated GIF, but I guess it's not working. But uh, for my Hamill fans out there, what comes next, as King George would say? All right, next slide, please. So we've got the good news is that we have 197 students across our partner high schools who are currently working towards some type of degree completion. Of that number, we have potentially 66 students who could graduate with, it, with a degree this year or in 2021 as they complete high school. We've also started some new partnership discussions, including one with West Orange High School, please don't tell Essex County. We're discussing expanding our work with the Hudson County Schools of Technology with both additional dual enrollment programs, as well as the integration of our courses into their schedules as elective choices. And finally, we recently had conversations with the modern Montessori School in Jordan. Uh, let me tell you, trying to um, coordinate those schedules uh, to have those Zoom conversations was a challenge in and of itself, given the time difference. But uh, we talked about possibilities for their senior students, senior level students, um, especially those who may be interested in pursuing college in the United States after their graduation and having the added benefit of being able to transfer courses with them once they arrive. Finally, we're looking to begin discussions with our high schools about option two. Uh, option two um, is ingrained in, in uh, the Department of Education and allows students to substitute college courses for their high school requirements. Currently in every high school in our county, students have to receive permission uh, from their own high school to have any of our courses transfer back in or count towards the requirements. Uh, our hope is to work with schools to pre-approve certain courses and promote those to their students to make the process easier, in essence, creating seamless transfer. And um, that, I hope, was five minutes, and that was supposed to be an animated GIF of Tom Cruise looking at his watch, not just a picture of Tom Cruise, but heck, it's Tom Cruise. So uh, with that said, I am done. Uh, feel free to uh, ask me any questions you'd like uh, and have a great rest of the day. Thanks. Thank you so much, Christopher. Oh my gosh, you must have put that, you must have rehearsed that on a timer. That was like exactly five minutes or less. So, but everyone, you did really, really well. We so appreciate everyone uh, adhering to this time schedule so that we could get on to other things like lunch. But we are going to uh, transition away from this now. So everyone, uh, we've come to the, oh you, yes, a wonderful panelist. We thank all of our speakers. I know we called you panelists, but you were speakers, presenters. We so thank uh, Trisha Clay, Kenneth uh, Malowski, you know, Willie Shiver, Colin Moore, and Eduardo. Uh, yes, we thank all of you so much for how you have helped with this. Thank you, Dr. Freeman, Dr. Dell Jones, Dr. Reber, uh, and for making all of this happen. Thank you to each of you listening. Hopefully you got a chance to see the messages in the chat area. I know there was a special thank you that came out from Michael for Lease 
So hopefully you all got an opportunity to see that. Uh, Michael Felice wanted to thank those individuals who had helped out with and served on the RTC. He wanted to give a special thank you to Dr. Sirhan Abdallah, Dr. Raphael Pernis, uh, Professor uh, Islam Shannonine, Peter Conrad, and so many others that have worked tirelessly throughout the summer to help guide the college to be um, up on all the safety issues during the pandemic. Special thank you again to uh, Yuris Kuhos and uh, Anna Krapinski and Amala Ogburn, and just a whole host of people, uh, Dr. Paula Roberson and so many others that have been stepping up to address all of the issues that have been happening. Uh, you know, Dr. Dorothy Anderson, I'm just thinking about, you know, uh, Dr. Um, Nicholas Cevalotti and so many others, uh, all of our board of trustees, our board of trustee members, uh, for everybody's efforts, all of the foundation members, just so many people are making all this happen. So this is it for the morning. So hopefully you all will have a nice little break and we'll go over. We invite everyone to the next session. So hopefully some of you are already popping off going over there, that's fine. Uh, the links can be found on the portal. You go open the portal page, you go under the link for academics, and right there in the lineup right there, the first thing says, uh, College Service Day, you click on that, and we have Omar of Williams to thank for that. And you click right there, and you can get the link to the next session, which is at 11 something. Uh, that's with the Center for Online Learning. So we can learn more about how we can serve our students on this mission of student success work. So again, goodbye, and we will see you next somewhere. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you so, so much. Any questions, please send me an email, text, or call if you have any questions. Thank you all so much. Sign out. Fantastic so, job, Louisa. Oh, thank you. Everyone. Thank you, Louisa. This was great. No, you all are fantastic. Uh, Colin, we have to stay here because I want to make sure we can capture all the things we need to capture. So, Colin, I do need you to stay behind. <laughs> But everyone thank you. Thank the only you. thing I the only thing I I missed was the Tom Cruise looking at <laughs> I know, we got to get you that. I thought you were gonna say those little crumpets that we used to eat. Oh my god. Uh, yeah, I I could, and the deviled eggs. I need some crumpets. I need yeah. some crumpets. I need a devil egg. Refill, but <laughs> I need a every at least so you can breathe a little bit easier right now, okay? <laughs> Right. Let it out. Just did a fantastic job. No, you all did. We, I thank you. I appreciate it. I know it. this is so stressful when you're trying to do something in a totally different way. It really is. It's like that you've never done before. We never. I feel like ever. shouting out into the void. I'm here. <laughs> you look. You have an amazing setup there, Tricia. I'm really jealous. Well, it's Dr. Friedman's conference room. I'm just stealing it for the day. <laughs> I, I I loved how you opened up the offer for anybody to teach out of the conference room. I'll never have a conference room to use again. That's fine. Our mission is to teach. Wow. This is really thank this is I have a secret for you. All you have to do is put a meeting invitation out there and block join and add, add the room and you can block it. When you yeah. need to. If you if you could work with Priyanka and Linda so they know how to do that, they manage that room. Yeah, we were. I was talking to her about it. I did ask her before. I just I didn't just squat the room. I asked. <laughs> I thought I thought Daryl did a excellent job. You know, he didn't he didn't uh, oversee that academic master plan process. Chris Wall did. That he picked that up and was able to translate that for everybody today in a beautiful way and emphasize some of the things that have been a little contentious lately so that people know where he stands on it. Mm -hmm. um, Trisha, you and Uris with ITV, I mean, that was so helpful and it's, it's showing people that we are going to do this, we're going to do it in the quick term. Um, I know Yuris is working behind the scenes to get some teachers lined up. 
So uh, even if they teach a portion of their remote classroom in there, it'll be so helpful to be able to say that we're splitting good use of this investment. It's a big investment. Yeah, and I totally agree. And, and we want people. Yeah, I and we. Yeah. Is just key to you know evangelizing it. But from my perspective, I really want to get people using it so that we so that we know how to help them do what they want to do effectively. Yeah, and and you know, Yuris, if you want to give somebody you know a two credit stipend to be a train the trainer person where they get really good with the technology and run info sessions with Trish's folks. You know, I, I'm thinking about Sharon Daughtry possibly and Melissa Williams. I'm I, just kidding. I'm Williams. kidding. I'm kidding. I, no, it'll be my first stipend in my life. I can go down in history and say, I got a stipend. No, I'm only kidding. Just kidding. It, that's always, you know, that's that's always a hard sell with the president when there's a salary administrator, but doesn't mean it's not possible. I'm only kidding. I, I'm 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 just um, eager to go I with that. I want you to know, Lalisa, so that you had a successful program for the first time. I sat here late last night with my stopwatch and timed myself, so oh. so I didn't go over eight minutes. I wanted you to be keep moving forward. Yes, we did. I think we did. I think we were able to, you know, based on the time that we had and, you know, trying to, you know, crunch everything into that time. So hopefully Acharna is over in her session doing what she needs to do. She has moderators in there. I haven't seen an email from anyone from her in yet. So So I'll let yeah, I'll let you go. I'll jump in there in a few minutes. Sure, okay. sure. Thanks. No worries. You Thank later. you, everybody. This is you, not easy to do all this. Oh, my goodness. This was the hardest thing I've ever done in my career. I, 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 I get it. I, I get it. But you, you're doing it with aplomb and with humor, and you bring that same energy and excitement about student success and professional development. So we can't see you sweating, seriously. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Talk to Colin and Sharon Daughter, who was up with me till uh, late. We'll just say late. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not showing. You're keeping a leaderly uh, focus and intensity. I think we all were grabbing our tissues when Chris was speaking. Oh, my goodness. So, you know. Well, I'm lucky that I have uh, you. I'm lucky I have you for a supervisor because in the back of my mind, it's like, Okay, you got to make Dr. Freeman proud. So <laughs> you, you are. So. You really are, and and so is yours, and so many others. And yeah. you know, I know that doing things in new modalities, doing things that weren't part of your job description before, mm -hmm. is a stretching of your self. Mm -hmm. And. Um, you know, I'm in the same boat where I do, you know, things that, that are asked of me that at first I wanted to go, you could probably find somebody to do this better. Um, but we take it on, and when we look back on it, we're great, even though it's hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, both of you are showing up 